Everyone, I'm super excited to be doing our next installment of the Hoodoo Tarot Majors. We're doing tarot study and part of that is looking at the cards in depth. And in this video, we are going to be exploring Gola Jack, which is traditionally the hanged man in the traditional Rider Waite Smith. Then we have Ancestors, which is traditionally the death card. I'm a big fan of the death card in the um, tarot um, for a multitude of reasons, and we'll discuss all of that in this video. And Father Sims, traditionally temperance. If any of this piques your interest, please, please stay tuned. We're about to dive into these cards, do some comparisons, and just see what our impressions are that comes up when we look at these cards individually. Stay tuned. Okay, so we have switched angles and now we are going to dive in. So, um, we have the Hoodoo Tarot right here and the deck that we're just going to lightly compare um, some of the images to is the Tazima African Tarot, okay? And I say lightly because this isn't a comparison. This is more to help us to uh, see some, um, when we see images in the Hoodoo Tarot, and it kind of stumps us we can always look at a tarot that we're more comfortable with or that is um, steeped in our home based preferred deck system which for me it is the rider Waite smith system so it, it it just helps me to really ground uh, my understanding of what i'm picking up and seeing in the hoodoo tarot's images and so yeah that's what we're doing here Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the Gullah Jack card, which is traditionally the Hanged Man. So I have the Hanged Man here from the Tazima. All right, so here he is hanging upside down, almost chill, right? Like... What I find interesting about Gullah Jack is that the hanged man situation has a rope around his neck, but it's not taut. It's not, you know, you know, hanging him, so to speak. It's, you know what I mean? So that's interesting to me if I'm just looking at this. Um, I don't know much about the man and the legend of Gullah Jack, so I will be relying on the guidebook, uh, the Hoodoo Tarot guidebook, that is, to help me with a little bit more on insight about what is this about. Also, the what's the symbol here on his forehead? Uh, I know traditionally for me, um, the hanged man speaks to hanging back sitting back uh not you know just suspending action suspending movement things suspended in air patience a need for patience um a need for pausing not moving forward um so those are the things that come to mind with the hanged man energy um, a new perspective often comes to mind when i think of the hanged man um, a call for a new look at things, right? Uh, when it comes up in a reading. So let's take a look at the guidebook for Gullah Jack. Because I, I just love that this is a strong, beautiful man here. But I, I am a little like, I'm a little perplexed as to why the rope is around his neck. So let's see what that's about. I already have it bookmarked and the before I go any further uh, the Hoodoo Tarot is created by Tiana Lee McQuiller artwork is by Caitlin V. Foisey. I love how the creator starts out the uh, card description with 
a Bible verse. In this one, it says, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And that is Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. The plant is hemp, and the image, let's get into the image. It says here, Gullah Jack has a noose around his neck, but his face is serene. He has a Congo cosmogram as his third eye. Gullah Jack, and they're not sure when he was born, but it looks like he passed away in 1822, was a Bakongo prisoner of war who was sold into slavery in Zanzibar. He was eventually sent to Charleston, South Carolina, and purchased by a man named Paul Pritchard. Gullah Jack had a reputation as a powerful root worker with a particular talent for making protective amulets. This may have been one of the reasons Telemach, a.k.a. Denmark Vesey, recruited him to plan a revolt consisting of only African-born men against the colonists. Gullah Jack instructed the rebels to eat a special diet of corn and peanuts the day of the attack and provided them with crab claws as, ta as a talisman to keep them safe. He also threatened to put the root on any other slaves who spoke of the plan. Unfortunately for the rebels, the plan was betrayed and the revolt was suppressed. All of the plotters, including Gullah Jack, were sentenced to death. But not before Gullah Jack used mysterious hand gestures, presumably to curse all of their oppressors. Gullah Jack was hanged on July 2nd, 1822. Oh my God. Meaning, the car meaning. Um, when Gullah Jack appears in a reading, you are most likely feeling stuck or severely limited. This card asks you, asks that you endure any discomfort, pain, or humiliation nobly until it's time to get moving again. In the meantime, there is nothing you can do except to be patient. This would be an excellent time to take up a course of study, practice meditation, read philosophy, and pray. Ask for the wisdom to know exactly what to do and how to get it done once your life is no longer on pause. Whatever you do, don't try to resist or force things to proceed prematurely. This card is a reminder to be a man or woman enough to accept any consequences of your actions. If the current stalemate is the direct result of your own ignorance or bad choices, then tough shit. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. You'll be free once the necessary lessons have been learned. Gullah Jack could also be trying to tell you that sometimes the sacrifice of your own desires for the good of the whole is the right thing to do. That's the other thing about the hanged man is sacrifice, right? What sacrifice that you need to consider is happening right now that you may need to do, right? If you receive Gullah Jack in a reading, consider the following. She says to wait, or you could pause and reflect. I like this one. It says it's okay to be vulnerable sometimes. Um, it's okay to change your mind. That speaks to that new perspective, right? If the sacrifice is worth it, then what are you waiting for? Now it's time to put the needs of others first, okay? That's what she puts here. So she has like a list of thing, different things to consider when this card comes up. I love that about this guidebook. And also, I, before I go even further into this video, I wanted to remind folks that even if you don't have the Hoodoo Tarot or the Tasma for that matter, you can still glean a lot of good insights about the major's card meanings from these videos because you can apply them, right? They I always say you can... You know, index these into your little mini Rolodex of your mind and call upon them, pull from them when necessary, when they when you need to, when they pop up in a reading. All right. So, yeah, that is the hanged man. That is a powerful hanged man. I, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, I guess he was serenely accepted and he made a sacrifice here. Right. And he serenely accepted his fate. Gullah Jack. Wow, that's a powerful story. So the next um, next one we're going to do is 
the ancestors. I'm just gonna put these to the side here. Okay, so the ancestors, which is traditionally the death card, okay? Um, where is my death card? Here we are. So this is the Tazima. And this is definitely giving me Rider Waite Smith inspirational vibes here, right? We have the little white flowered rose or little white rose or flower here on the flag. Uh, this person on the, he has a, a, looks like a gun or bayonet. And he's on a horse, a white horse, walking through a meadow. The only thing that's missing is like the different bodies and skeletons and all of that jazz. But there's a skeletal face here. If you look carefully, there's a skeletal face here on the baby. And what we know about the death is there is a new beginning about to be born right when there's an ending there's a new beginning there's a transition there's a transformation from one state to the other with the death card um, sometimes in love readings if the death card comes up you know and the person is like oh you know what's ha gonna happen to my relationship it's really feeling tumultuous and you get the death card there could be it could mean that there's a, a change of state in the relationship, a change from, you know, being in a relationship to not being in a relationship. There's a new beginning at hand here, right? Um, for singles, if it came up in a love reading, um, it, it, there's a change of state. You're going to be transformed into someone who's single to someone who is in a relationship. Just to give you one of the many ways that the death card could apply in a reading here. Um, I find it just interesting, though, that it's a baby, you know, with a little skeletal face. A little disarming, but I like it. I do appreciate this death card, I have to say. Let's take a look at the guidebook here. I already tapped it, I think. Okay. So... Here is the scripture. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagle shall eat it. And that is Proverbs chapter 30, verse 17. Plant, flower of stone, the image. A happy baby is lying in a crib. Though her form is young, there is a part of her that is very old. The half of her face that is skeletal reflects this eternal connection with the ancestors. And that was one thing I didn't mention. I love how the death card, how she changed the word from death to ancestors, right? And then she says, ancestor veneration is one of the least discussed, but most ubiqu ubiquitous features of human life since time immemorial. Though the aesthetics of ancestral veneration vary depending on the culture, there are few people who feel comfortable with their dead just being dead. Instead, humans have created hundreds of other dimensions for their souls to inhabit, where they may or may not be accessible to the living. In hoodoo, we may have access to any spirit of the dead if the deceased is willing and we are skilled enough to make and maintain contact. It is quite common in both indigenous American and African cultures to consult the ancestors via various methods of divination, channeling, or meditation for those in the community who had the skill and the authority to do so. The death of family members was no excuse to begin excluding them from the affairs of the nation, rites, and rituals, nor from accepting their input regarding the major life decisions of their living relations. In the traditional mind, neither time nor space could separate us from our kin. Ancestral veneration, however, is much deeper than lighting candles, attending special events, or asking questions now and then. Ancestral veneration, in its most traditional sense, is supposed to inform our behavior on a daily and continual basis. It's about knowing, honoring, and defending one's bloodline. It's about personifying the most esteemed values of your foremothers and forefathers and doing one's best to add on positively to your family's legacy. 
It is about reflecting on and identifying how our parents and grandparents' actions affected our lives and considering how our decisions could affect our great-grandchildren tomorrow. Wow. Meaning. Death is not a subject most Westerners or Western-educated people like to discuss. It's an event that will happen to each and every one of us, yet it is considered morbid, weird, or taboo to spend any time contemplating it. Death is just the beginning of that something. I'm just skipping through for time's sake. <laughs> so when the ancestor's card turns up in a reading, you are being reminded that the only thing that is truly permanent is impermanence. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to mourn, but you must let go. Life goes on. If you receive the ancestors in a reading, consider the following. Here's some of the things she asks us to consider, right? Every end is also a new beginning. The only thing that is constant is change. Put the past behind you and start over. Learn how to embrace the unknown. Do you know who your ancestors are? I don't know if she has any others back here. Oh, she does. I'll just read like a couple more. Do you feel connected to your ancestors? Why or why not? Do genealogy research or create a family tree? I love the angle and direction that she went with the death card um, because it speaks so much to you know hoodoo and, and ancestral veneration something that is is really big in my spiritual uh life right now so that's why this card resonates deeply with me but i have to say when i first first got this there were even before when i you know when they were first showing a few images before this deck was released a couple of years back i was like whoa but now i love it now oh, I love it. Okay, we have one more car we're going to explore. And that is Father Sims, traditionally temperance. Here we go. Here we go. It's, you know, pretty traditional in, in this depiction here, right? We have someone pouring into a cup um, of equal measure. So it's a balanced pouring. Um, I love that. I love his purple robe, how regal he is. He's got a pleasant smile. That, that to me, denotes harmony, peace. Um, there's a cabin off in the background. You know, you're feeling anchored, uh, solid, secure with where you're at. This is, I love this. I actually really appreciate this temperance card. And in here, it actually is more, if you would, you know, more traditional than what we've got going over here in the Tazima. But that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. But yeah, there's a rooster here. Let me show you. It's a rooster. I wonder what that's about. A tree in the background. I just can't get over that beautiful smile that he has on his face. So let's take a look, shall we? Let's take a look, see, at Father Sims. The scripture. <laughs> Who gives the ibis wisdom or gives the rooster understanding? Job, chapter 38, verse 36. Plant, pea vine. The image. Father Sims is dressed in the purple satin robe in which he liked to work. The rooster represents him, and the two streams of water represents his baptism as a two-headed doctor, a hoodoo that does good and bad work. Father George Sims, born Joe Watson and nicknamed the Frizzly Rooster, was a preacher and root worker from New Orleans. They called him the Frizzly Rooster because many people kept at least one chicken in the backyard for the sole purpose of scratching up any roots that may have been placed there by an enemy. He had a reputation for being able to effectively place or live curses and read anyone. Father Sims was a bit eccentric and was comfortable doing good or bad workings. He gave sermons at Myrtle Wreath Hall, and that's where his most famous student, 
Zora Neale Hurston made his acquaintance. After weeks of performing superficial tasks without anything being explained to her, she was initiated by Father Sims, given the name The Boss of Candles, and finally taught the deeper mysteries. It is com- is a common misconception that root work is never an initiatic system because while this is the case for many, initiations are not unheard of. It's a nice bit of education, right? Nini, when Father Sims comes up in a reading, is asking you to review your position regarding your inquiry. Or inquiry, because I don't want to be corrected, y'all. If you've taken an extreme or one-sided position, now's the time to consider things from a more balanced perspective. Things do not have to be black and white. So don't, don't, let's see, don't force it to be, right? If you have been asked to compromise or cooperate, but you feel resistant to the idea, this card is a good sign that you haven't considered all the aspects of the situation. If you've been asked to give someone an answer, Don't respond until you feel more centered. I love that. To do otherwise may cause deep regret and feelings to be hurt unnecessarily. Try to be fair. And and you don't want to pour from an empty vessel as well, right? It's best to, to make decisions from a grounded place. To give yourself the grace to have a sacred pause before you take action, before you give an answer. This is just me adding this. I'm not reading in the guidebook. But that's what I also pick up with Father Sims, right? Now we're going back to the guidebook. If you receive Father Sims in a reading, consider the following. What would be gained by compromising? Is it worth more than the perceived loss? Are you being fair? Sometimes less is more. Extremists never think they're extreme. Peace is priceless. Amen to that. Focus on healing and recovery because that is another part of uh, the temperance card. It's about healing, recovery, um, wholeness. I'm back to the guidebook. An alliance is not such a bad idea. I like this one. What am I bringing to the potluck dinner? And then she puts, perhaps add something else to the mix. And then finally, this is an interesting one. She says, other races, religions, and ethnic groups exist. Maybe it's time to learn more about other people. So there you have it, folks. That is the three cards we're focusing on in this video. I hear someone knocking at the door, so I need to go ahead and wrap this video up. And we will resume this moving on to the next cards. I will see you all later. Take good care of yourselves. Bye for now.